Now we have spent some time learning about the gods of Olympus, and I want to tell you a story today about the heroes of Greece, the Aegean heroes. And they were called the Aegean heroes because these are leaders and heroes that lived in civilizations, in cities um, that are on the Aegean Sea. If you look at the map of Greece that we are drawing together this week, you will see the Aegean Sea there in the center and around it, just surrounded on all sides by many different islands and peninsulas and many different powerful cities at the time. And we're going to hear how some of these leaders, these different cities, um, some of the conflicts that they had and how those conflicts were resolved And you will hear of heroes and men, and you will also hear some of our gods from um, Mount Olympus come into the story. In the plain of Argos, near the sea, at Mycenae and Sparta, Tyrans and Athens rose mighty fortresses with heavy stone foundations and walls. These were built on hills in sight of the sea, the better to protect the huts of the shepherds and gardeners outside the walls, who were dependent on the princes or kings whose palaces were within. Further to the west and northward was Ithaca, whose king joined the Aegeans in their deeds of courage. To the east, across the Aegean Sea, was the city of Troy, the greatest of the cities of men. Its walls were so strong and high that enemies could not scale them or break through them. Troy had high towers and great gates. In its citadels were strong men, well armed. In its treasuries were stores of gold and silver. Each city had its king. Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, was a mighty man and brave. He was a head taller than all the other heroes. His brother, Menelaus, was king of Sparta. Odysseus, king of Ithaca, was the wisest of the kings in the west. The king of Troy was Priam. He was an old man, but had sons who were good captains, and the noblest of them was Hector, the protector of Troy. Another of Priam's sons was not counted among the captains. Paris was his name. When Paris was a baby, a fortune teller had told Priam that his son would bring trouble upon Troy. Then King Priam sent Paris away from the city to be brought up by country people as a shepherd. Now it happened that all the gods were invited to the marriage of Peleus, another hero king, to Thetis, a river nymph, and so were the goddesses, all except Eris, or Discord, who came uninvited. After the wedding, there were games, and Eris threw a golden apple among the guests, on which were written the words, For the fairest. The goddesses began to quarrel over who should have the apple, each thinking herself the fairest, Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera. But no one dared judge which was the fairest until the shepherd, Paris, came by, and the guests asked him to be the judge. Hera said, If you will give me the apple, I will make you a king. Athena said, If you give it to me, I will make you the wisest of men. Aphrodite said, I will make you beautiful, and the fairest woman in the world will be your wife. Paris looked on Aphrodite, and in his eyes she was the fairest. So he gave the apple to her, and she was forever afterwards his friend. Then Paris became the most beautiful of all youths. He traveled through Greece till he came to Sparta, where ruled King Menelaus, whose queen Helen was the fairest woman in all the world. Paris fell in love with her, and Aphrodite inspired Helen to fall in love with Paris, who carried her off to Troy. King Menelaus sent to Troy, demanding that Helen be returned to him. King Priam and Hector knew what a wrong had been done, and that Helen should be sent back. But in the council of Troy, where there were vain men who thought it would be proud to boast, to be able to say that the fairest woman in all the world was in their city, and they prevailed against Priam and Hector, saying that no little Greek king could make them give her up. When Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, heard that that Troy refused to give up his brother's wife, he vowed to injure Troy. He called all the princes and kings of Greece together, urging them to unite and sail against Troy, take the city, and avenge the injury done to Menelaus. He promised them great glory and riches for themselves. The kings of Greece took note of their own strength and were eager to make war upon 
upon Troy. So they bound themselves by a vow to take the city. Then Agamemnon sent messages to the heroes whose lands were far away, to Odysseus of Ithaca, and Achilles, son of Peleus, bidding them also to enter the war. In two years the ships of all the kings and princes were gathered together with their leaders, Agamemnon, Odysseus, and Achilles, and they sailed for the coast of Troy. It was many years before they returned to Greece, and of their leaders many never returned. Although they captured many cities around Troy, they could not easily conquer Troy itself. Its high walls protected it. For many years the Greeks besieged the city. They built their camp on the seashore, below the walls of Troy, and they built a wall to protect their their camp and their ships, which were pulled up on the beach. Though the Trojans were safe behind their mighty walls, still they were unable to come and go, nor could they drive away the hosts of the Greeks." Now the Trojans are the names, is the name of the people who lived in Troy. They were called Trojans. Now Achilles, who was the great grandson of Zeus, brought with him a host of warriors called the Myrmidons and two immortal horses that had been given to his father Peleus by Zeus. He also carried a great spear, which none but he could wield, and he was the mightiest of the Greek warriors when he deigned to fight. But Achilles was stubborn and only loved his friend Patroclus, who had been as a brother to him all his life and who was lost to him as a result of his own stubbornness. The Trojan Hector alone had the greatest of leadership among the Trojans. Besides being brave, Hector was generous and gentle spoken to all and thought of his people before himself. After years of siege, Hector decided to take his army outside the city to fight upon the plain and drive the Greeks back to their ships. Just at this time, Achilles and Agamemnon had had a quarrel over the love of the maiden Briseis. Achilles would have killed Agamemnon in anger if the goddess Athena had not intervened. Now Achilles refused to fight. Hector and the Trojans were encamped on the plain prepared for battle. Still, Achilles refused to fight, and Agamemnon led the battle to the walls of Troy and was wounded. Hector waited until Agamemnon returned back, then led an attack and would have reached the Greek wall, but Odysseus led a counterattack and drove the Trojans back. And so the battle raged back and forth night and day. Many heroes were wounded. Hector was hurt by a big stone, but was revived by the god Apollo. In the midst of the battle, the eagle and the blood-red serpent struggled over the heads of the fighters. The Trojans broke through the big gate of the Greek wall and rushed to set fire to the Greek ships. But the Greeks fought them back and away. Still Achilles had refused to fight, and his friend Patroclus persuaded him to let him enter the battle dressed in Achilles' armor and led Achilles' warriors in the chariot drawn by the two immortal horses. Patroclus brought courage to the Greeks, and with the Myrmidons drove the Trojans back to the walls of their city. Patroclus then was hit in the back by a stone. Some say it was Apollo who hurled the stone to bring Patroclus down, and that Apollo did it because he did not want Troy to be taken in this way. As Patroclus lay stunned, Hector slew him and took Achilles' armor for himself. It was Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, that told Achilles of Patroclus' death. At last Achilles showed himself without his armor on the Greek wall and shouted so that the Trojans heard him and saw him with a flame of fire around his head. They were afraid and stood still, and so the Greeks were able to take the body of Patroclus back to their camp. Thetis, the mother of Achilles, had Hephaestus make him a new suit of armor. Wearing this shining armor, Achilles at last entered the battle knowing that he too would lose his life. Would not the armor protect him? Then too, as a baby, Thetis had sought to make him immortal. Holding him by one heel, she had dipped him head first into the waters of the river Styx, the sacred river in the underworld which must be crossed by the souls of the dead on their way to the realm of Hades. Only his heel was untouched by the water of the river. Did any mortal know of this? One cannot tell of the courage of the mortal heroes in this dire struggle without telling of the deeds of the gods. Some of the fateful events were brought to pass by men unchallenged by the gods. 
while others took place through the intervention of gods and goddesses. Athena had intervened in the quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon. She was on the side of the Greeks. Apollo fought for the Trojans, assisting Hector. Aphrodite rescued Paris from the weapon of Menelaus. Athena guided the spear of the Greek Diomedes to kill a Trojan. Then Aphrodite shielded her son Aeneas, a Trojan, from Diomedes, but received a spear wound herself. The blood of the gods flowed, and Aphrodite fled. Apollo took her place and carried Aeneas to safety. Ares, the god of war, opposed Diomedes. But Athena mounted the chariot of Diomedes and drove it at Ares, then guided Diomedes' spear directly and straight through Ares' belly. With a roar as of ten thousand men, Ares flew to Zeus. Now Zeus commanded the gods not to help either the Greeks or the Trojans. He himself took charge of the course of the war. It is told that he brought to pass as much shedding of blood as he could. Both Hector and Achilles died in battle. Achilles knew where to strike Hector who was wearing Achilles' armor. Achilles knew where there was one small opening in that armor, and the point of his spear found it in the neck." But it was the god Apollo who knew where to strike Achilles. In spite of Zeus, Apollo guided an arrow shot by Paris into Achilles' heel, and the wound was fatal. The Trojans had had the aid of most of the gods, and the Greeks were helped mainly by Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Yet it was Odysseus, wise in himself, who contrived the trick that at last led to the downfall of Troy. Ten years of war had not brought victory to the Greeks or the Trojans. How much longer was it to go on? One morning, when the Trojans looked down from their high walls, they saw no Greek camp, no Greek ships. The Greeks had disappeared. On the empty battlefield stood a tremendous wooden horse. After a time, they went forth to take a closer look. Made of planks, it was written... The Greeks leave this as an offering to Athena. Now there was much dispute among the Trojans. Some wanted to push the horse back into the sea. Others wanted to make it as a trophy into the city to Athena's temple. Laocoon, a priest of Troy, insisted that the horse concealed Greek soldiers. Helen of Sparta, for whom the war had been started, walked around the horse calling to each Greek hero in the voice of his wife, but there was only silence. Laocoon hurled a spear into the side of the horse, but there was only a hollow sound as of an empty cavern. Then a terrible thing happened. Two great sea snakes appeared from out of the waves and wrapped themselves around Laocoon and his two sons. Tightening their coils, they crushed the lives out of the three men. Then the snakes made their way to Athena's temple and vanished. The Trojans were horrified by what they had seen, and they were sure that Laocoon had been punished for his violence against Athena. The Trojans made a breach in the walls of Troy so as to take the great horse into the city so as not to anger Athena any more. That night there was feasting and merriment among the Trojans, and at last they fell asleep without fear of any enemy presence in their midst. In the silence of the sleeping city, an opening appeared in the side of the horse, and from it emerged Odysseus, who had designed the whole plan, followed by a number of Greeks. A beacon fire was lighted and answered by a flare from Agamemnon's ship as it led the other Greek ships out of hiding back to the beaches below Troy. Before the citizens of Troy wakened, the streets were swarming with Greeks. They set fire to the houses and sought out men, women, and children to slay them. King Priam was shown no mercy. Hector's young son was killed, and Menelaus sought out Helen to kill her, but her beauty overcame him, and he took her, eventually back to Sparta. Troy was reduced to ashes. Its people either slaughtered or taken as slaves." And that, with the trick horse, was the end of the ten-year war between the Greeks and the Trojans. Now, a portion of this tale became known as the Iliad, which was a great dramatic epic poem written by the Greek, famous Greek poet Homer. And Homer lived about 400 years after the Battle of Troy. And he wrote down the story and accounted for all of these heroes and gods. 
And all of the Greeks knew of this story and probably had parts of it memorized and knew it by heart. And there were great orators who would travel the countryside and stand in great stone outdoor theaters and recite the Iliad. And it was not just the ancient Greeks who knew of the Iliad. It is an incredible piece of literature that has been written and passed down and has been read by people from all over the world and still is read to this day and is still translated from the original Greek into many different languages. And I want to tell you now about a man who lived many hundreds of years after Homer, but who read the Iliad and loved the Iliad and the other um, epic poem by Homer, the Odyssey. And he lived in Turkey, and his name was Henry Schleiman. He was born in 822 AD, so many a century after the fall of Troy. He was the son of a German pastor who told him all the old Greek tales, including the story I just told you. Henry lived in a romantic neighborhood as a boy. Behind his father's garden was a pool from which, it was said, a maiden rose holding a silver bowl in her hand. Similar tales were told in connection with neighboring hills and forests. At 14 years, Henry had to go to work as an errand boy for a country grocer. One evening, a man came into the shop and asked for some refreshment, then sat down and began to recite Greek poetry. Henry couldn't understand Greek, but the melodious words stirred him deeply, and he asked the man to say them again and again. After that, Henry's deepest desire was to learn Greek. A few years later, he went to work in a business house in Amsterdam as an errand boy. Wherever he went, even in the rain, he carried a book of Homer with him, reading and memorizing passage after passage. Schliemann got on well. Soon he had a business of his own and at last had time to learn Greek. He read everything he could find about the ancient Greeks. He believed that the tales of Troy were true, although everyone laughed at such an idea. It is said that he even dreamed in his sleep of a place where he could find the ruins of Troy. As soon as he had accumulated enough wealth and money to finance an expedition, he went to this place. This was in 1870, and there he excavated and found nine cities, nine ancient cities, one within the other, the sixth being the Troy of the Iliad. And one of the books that Schliemann read was by Pausanias, an ancient Greek traveler who described Mycenae and the tomb of Agamemnon. Seeking the truth of the legend, Schliemann went to Mycenae and there found, in the depths of the earth, not only a gorgeous and princely tomb, but also the ruins of a great fortified palace such as had been described. The tomb showed that the king had been buried in great magnificence, a golden crown, diadems, pendants, necklaces, ornaments, plates, and vases of pure gold were piled high in the tomb. In another tomb, he found 870 objects made of the purest gold. So Henry is credited with discovering ancient Troy and ancient Greece and bringing to light that some of these legends and events told by Homer, while they are legends and they are stories, that they are probably based on real events. And we have Henry to thank for that. <laughs> 